talk about the 1919 Winnipeg general strike, which occurred a few months uh, after the 1919 Seattle uh, general strike, right? So a little, little, little uh, quick recap of what happened in Seattle in 1919. Basically, uh, the, the shipyard workers were uh, promised by the government that if they work for um, lower wages to help the war effort, that they will be compensated fairly and better, uh, you know, after the war in 1919. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the union tried to negotiate, the workers tried to negotiate with the, um, the, the managers and the bosses, and they basically said no. So they decided to strike. And uh, right, right as the strike started, um, they also looked to pretty much every other union, every other worker in the city of Seattle and said, hey, can you join with us? Can you come and, and, and strike in solidarity with us? And then that's what happened. So, and so that was the first general strike where 65,000 people said that they were just not going to show up to work. Uh, people started freaking out. This was right at the heels of the Bolshevik Revolution. So everybody was like, oh my God, is this communism? The, commun the communists are here, guys. They're fucking here. How did they even make it? How did this, I did this ideology get a passport to, to get into the country even? Who's, I mean, what are we doing about ideological immigration? Have we even thought about putting this down for democracy? You know? So, uh, so there was a six, it was a six day strike. Um, and here's the thing none of the strikers were violent. They actually used some older striker, uh, older labor organizers and the veterans that were out of work to, um, to help corral the strikers. Uh, there was a lot of community community driven efforts, uh, like dine-ins. Uh, people were, you know, taking oil to hospitals. They were collecting people's garbage. A lot of these community efforts were being driven uh, by people that were striking, by people that were organizing. So uh, there was a there was a solid effort behind it, and that's when um, you had, uh, you know, the, like. The city government was freaking out. Ole Hansen was the mayor, uh, basically thought that this was going to lead into a violent revolution. So like, uh, like the National Guard was called, the army was called. They were, you know, uh, so then they started arresting stri uh, the strike leaders. Uh, they just started arresting them. Um, and that's when morale dipped because all of the leaders and the organizers were being arrested uh, on false charges. Um, and, you know, uh, so basically people kind of, disbanded the strike from there after six days right and and really <laughs> the only points of violence came from Ole Hansen who was saying that he's going to you know fight back against the, the the communists trying to take away our democracy by basking for fair wages and treatment for the employees right so uh so that so it was that and then but like the strikers never got violent um which is what they what what you know the the claim was that's why we need all these cops out here we need all these army people out here um it was pretty peaceful it was a community led effort um so but it was the first general strike uh that uh, that we had ever seen um so there were some kinks that needed to be worked out nobody knew exactly how they were going to um, disband them. Now, there's a lot more detail uh, in the last video that I did uh, specifically in regards to the 1919 Seattle general strike uh, that you can go check out. There was whispers and rumors of assassinations and things of that sort. Um, but it was a six-day strike. Now, at the same time, a few months later, in, in Winnipeg, which is in Canada, if you are not familiar with anything outside the United States and think that the whole world revolves around the United States, much like most of the people in Galileo's time thought that the whole universe revolved around the planet Earth, and then they were proven wrong, much like the people in the United States in five years will be proven wrong that nothing revolves around the United States and that the United States has falsely made a gravitational pull around itself by eating too much McDonald's. But anyway, uh, that's, not, that's not the point of this video. <laughs> Um, the 1919 Winnipeg general strike uh, started just a few months after that, right? So the Seattle general strike happened uh, February, January, February, and this starts happening in the spring, uh, April, May is when is when this start ha this starts happening. So once again, after World War II, Canadian employees uh, were were basically uh, thrown to the wolves, right? The employers 
were making uh, quite a bit of money. They were, they were reaping the benefits of the war. And um, unemployment was at, a, at an all-time high. Vets who served couldn't get a job. Um, housing and food costs were rising, uh, and a lot of immigrant workers uh, were living in less than perfect conditions. Okay. Now, you got to think about it this way, right? <laughs> this is when the immigrant scapegoat argument is used. When people are suffering, when, when citizens are not doing well because, you know, you have a bunch of like Wall Street fat cats that are making a shit ton of money that, you know, it's like the banks are getting bailed out over the American populace because of a fake economy that needs to be ran instead of the real economy that's run by small businesses, is run by the people. Uh, it's always, well, the immigrants... Well, they came in here and they stole the economy. That's what they did, okay? That's what, that's what they always do. They come in and they steal some of the economy and then they just send it overseas by mail. So we got to stop them from doing that. Ban immigrants from going to the post office. They always, they always scapegoat the immigrants whenever... But the, but the blamers are the ones that are creating these worst conditions. So, so the question really should be, whenever that stuff happens, whenever people start scapegoating immigrants, is the person putting the blame on the immigrants, what are they doing to improve the life of the worker? What are they doing to make your life better as the worker? Um, ask yourself that question, which most people don't. <laughs> so at the heels of, this, this all comes at the heels of the uh, uh, 1917, Russian Revolution, with, which was like a people's revolution, um, and everybody kind of freaked out and said that, you know, the, oh my God, this is, so, this is communism, communism is coming to, uh, to, to America, to Canada, you know, and, and what are we going to do? This is going to be the downfall of democracy. They're, they're going to they're gonna take over and, and, and help people. This is crazy. Everybody should be in competition with each other. If the working class isn't trying to murder itself, on a constant basis, that's not democracy. That's that's communism, which is also not communism. Uh, <laughs> but there was also this thing called um, syndicalism that was growing. This this idea of syndicalism was also growing, and that was a term that I had never heard before. So I uh, so here here is a definition of syndicalism. Uh, it is an international attempt to organize all workers into unions and worker councils. The goal of syndicalism was to bring down capitalism and give workers the means of production. To achieve this, it supported actions such as general strikes. The, movements were, the movement was active in the first half of the 20th century. Okay, so that's what syndicalism is. It's, it's an international movement um, to, to help uh, you know, workers seize the means of their own production. Um, and, and there was a lot of people in Canada also calling for one big union. They wanted one big union to represent all workers instead of just smaller unions that are, you know, that represent its particular, you know, uh, little factions like shipyard workers or iron workers or whatever. Like you could still have them, but they would be under the conglomerate of one big union that kind of standardized the, the work conditions for everybody. That was kind of the, the idea behind... Uh, what was what was being um, what was being said at that time, right? Uh, which you can also make the make the correlation that like that's kind of what the democratic socialist movement is all about too. Is is that they want you know this one big union idea of like okay, people should be taken care of in this particular manner. People should be doing you know we we should be granting people health care. We shouldn't be trying to put a a, a literal price tag on the human body. Right. Like we, we shouldn't be doing that sort of stuff. We should be helping people. We should be uh, that should just be an intrinsic quality that we shouldn't try to make a profit off of, like the, like the setting these sort of bigger general rules. Um, so in May of 1919, in May of 1919, the building and metal workers uh, tried to negotiate with their employers. That was a no go. Pr pretty much. Uh, the the bosses, uh, you know, of the building and metal workers were just like, fuck off. We're not going to, why, get out of here, you know. You want these handouts, you know, these handouts for the jobs that you're doing. You should just be happy that you're working. 
okay. That's basically how they um, handle that situation. Uh, and uh, the Winnipeg Trades and Labor Council, in sympathy, uh, in sympathy and solidarity uh, for the metal workers and building workers, said general strike. We need to do a general strike to make sure that the conditions of all of the employees, uh, all of the workers, um, gets met. You know, we so 30,000 workers left their jobs. Now, this is slightly less than the Seattle um, Seattle general strike because the Seattle general strike was 65,000 people. More people for less time. Um, the Winnipeg one lasted about six weeks, so less people, more time. Um, and uh, so, so once again, th this was not just the metal. This was everybody, right? Like the whole the whole city essentially was was taken down. Uh, you had blue collar manufacturing workers. You had white collar workers. You had police, firefighters, bankers, postal workers. It, basically, everybody that you would consider an essential worker was was going to strike at this point. Like they just wouldn't wouldn't be uh, doing you know the the quote unquote job. So this was organized by the Central Strike Committee. Uh, they were nonviolent. They they wanted civil discussions for better pay and better work conditions. Once again, these are not. I, I, I keep reiterating this because there's a lot of these um, like anti-strikers, you know, why can't these people be happy with what they have kind of thing. But this is not really like asking for anything crazy, you know, like we're not asking for gold toilets in every cubicle here. We're literally asking for uh, better work conditions, better pay, more more fair pay, by the way, is is like considering the the rate of inflation, right? Especially in 1919 after the war, the housing costs, food costs were going up, but the pay wasn't going up. People were working 12 hours. People were, um, you know, uh, some of them weren't even getting jobs. They were just kind of suffering um, and couldn't do anything, or they were or they were getting paid very little to do all these jobs. So so this now, you know, was was somebody that was advocating uh, for the worker, right? Because this is something that we've said before is there is no one at the negotiating table in terms of Congress or um, in terms of any of the stuff uh, that represents the worker, right? Like, like these, these, these closed door meetings that happen where it's Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and, you know, Joe Biden and, and Trump and all these people and they sit around and they smoke their cigars and like they're, we're not represented in that room. All of these people are like millionaires and billionaires that essentially are like, hey, how do we, you know, enrich ourselves even further than what we already have kind of thing. But nobody's sitting there and saying, well, how do we take care of the American worker? What do the workers need? How can they be taken care of? And that's what the unions are doing. That's what the Central Strike Committee essentially was going to do, was bringing, bringing the workers' voice to the negotiating table so that we were actually represented in some of the laws and the bills that are being put into place. Now, there was an opposition. Uh, there was an opposition. It was called the Citizens Committee. It was made of a thousand people. Uh, and it was like manufacturers, bankers, politicians, so on and so forth, right? Mostly, I'm, I'm guessing the manufacturers were not like manufacturing employees. They were more um, probably like, um, uh, I'm losing the words here. Sorry. Sorry for my brain fart. Uh, they were probably like the bosses, like the manufacturing bosses that were involved. So, you know... This is also a thousand versus thirty thousand people that wanted this, right? That thirty thousand people that came out and said, "We don't support what the bosses are doing. We don't support these conditions." Um, versus a thousand people that were like, "This is communism," like the you know. So the citizens' committee, uh, the opposition community, called them uh, called it Bolshevism. They said that this was organized by enemy aliens. Ooh, the aliens are coming down, you guys. They're here. Oh, no. So scary. Uh, so these xenophobic attacks levied towards immigrants is what they were trying to do. Once again, that scapegoat comes in, right? They're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to be like, if it, wait, the, the pure, poor Canadians are being, they're being taken advantage of by these aliens that are coming in here and they're, and they're, 
they're they're seizing the means of production. <laughs> These aliens, they're 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 asking for 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 more respect for the work. How dare you? How the, the your respect is is give, given to you in little little morsels by by the by the bourgeoisie and and that and that's how it's got to be okay that's what that's that's how are we supposed to do? we're not good at manufacturing as 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 these politicians that make laws we're we're not good at, at fetching food I, I i i don't even know how to make toast unless unless some some lowly immigrant worker makes it for me how dare you how dare you ask me to respect that immigrant worker so uh so they refused to meet with the central strike committee right the central strike committee was like let's talk about it let's talk about what these workers are looking for let's talk about how to like what our demands are and how we can meet them they refused to meet them they basically said that at this point they could deport um any british immigrant if they wanted to under sedition so within two weeks um the central the citizen committee resorted to violence uh unprovoked unprovoked violence right they called these people specials um and they would ride around on horses with bats and conduct night raids uh and then eventually 10 leaders of this uh, central strike committee and two leaders of the one big union they did make a one big union were arrested by the government um and so on June 17th, they got arrested. On June 21st, uh, there was a silent parade held by the strikers in solidarity um, of their leaders, right? So this was a silent strike. It was a silent parade, and they marched. And uh, they marched down Winnipeg, and then the police attacked the strikers. And eventually, there was a, a streetcar pushed over. So here's, here's an image of that. So this is what happened, right? They eventually... After they were provoked, um, the, the strikers pushed over the streetcar, uh, two protesters were killed, and 30 people were injured. 30 people were injured. I mean, that, that's kind of crazy that, like, a whole streetcar just got pushed over. Um, but here's the thing is, like, they were just silently marching until the police decided to, uh, to attack them. Um, and this wasn't just the police, right? It was a combined effort of the police, the army, and the specials. Uh, they beat these nonviolent protesters that were standing in solidarity for the illegal arrests of their strike leaders, asking to be who were asking to to be treated humanely at work and compensated fairly. That's what was going on. That's the little daisy chain, <laughs> right? Like the strike leaders were like, "Let's meet up and talk about how we can." treat each other with respect let's let's meet up and talk about how we can be compensated fairly they get arrested just for saying that um and then you know there was a non-violent parade that led to uh the police the army and the specials beating the shit out of non-violent protesters who then retaliated uh and through that retaliation a, a streetcar was uh, tipped over two people died um and 30 people were injured so the moral is, if you want to value the intrinsic nature of just humanity in and of itself, uh, the power, the powers that be uh, will, will beat the shit out of you. Uh, why? Because uh, democracy. That's, that's how you save democracy, is, uh, is by, uh, by beating people uh, asking to be treated fairly. Let that be a lesson. <laughs> Look, the best authority, the best, blah, blah. the best authoritarians are the ones that come wearing the face of democracy itself, right? Those are the best ones. The the wolves in voters' clothing, the wolves that come out and they say that we're standing, you know, we're standing by you. We we believe in you, and then they go and they legislate on behalf of uh, of of just corporations of the bosses, they don't give a shit about you. And even when you just come up and be like, can we just talk about what the fuck is going on here? They're like, we are gonna kill you now. Those, those are the best authoritarians. So basically the way that um, Seattle was treated, the way that Winnipeg was treated, um, 
and the way that a lot of people are treated now, right, is is you, you, you see these champions of democracy, these champions of Western civilization, these champions of capitalism, um, and, you know, these workers try to ask for something better. These workers sit there and say, hey, we are trying to... Uh, we are trying to do the best for everybody. We want everybody to be taken care of in the best way. And you see people um, like Chris Smalls at, at the Amazon warehouse who gets fired. So what was the result of the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike? Um, the, the Central Strike Committee called off the strike to curtail the violence. They were basically afraid that if they continued the strike, if they continued to demonstrate peaceably, more people were going to die, more people were going to get injured, morale would end up being lost. A lot of people would, you know, essentially like they would lose family and it would turn into it, it would turn into another civil war. And, you know, they didn't they didn't want to take any kind of violent action. That's not what they were about, you know. So so again, who who the nonviolent people that didn't commit the violent in the first place were like, Ah, fuck. Okay, we gotta call it off because these 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 children are are you know throwing sticks at us and throwing stones at us and trying to fucking kill us for for just being treated. They're they're like, oh, you want to be treated better? Oh, we'll show you how bad we can treat you. You don't even know. You don't even know how crazy we can get. Like just. <laughs> This is how, like, abusive partners talk. <laughs> you know, like, whenever... If you've ever been, like, a real shit relationship, which I'm so sorry if you've been in a real shit relationship. Like, I've also been in real shit relationships before. Uh, and it's always just like, hey, I kind of don't like the way that you're, you're, you're treating me or, like, saying stuff to me. I feel like it's really awful and mean and rude and and they're like oh i can show you awful oh just wait because i'm gonna get so awful <laughs> that's what the government was doing it's like oh you want to be treated fairly oh let me show you how unfair i can get arrested and then killed boom suck on that citizens and and those are that those are those are the champions of democracy, you guys, champions of democracy using the army to fire upon their own citizens. You know, like how a democracy works. <laughs> so after all this, seven strike leaders in Canada were arrested under uh, under conspiracy to overthrow the government. But really, I mean. What a bullshit charge, because the government was overthrowing itself at that point, right? By, by not standing with the people, by, by basically using authoritarian tactics to prove that they weren't authoritarian, at that point, your own hypocrisies are overthrowing you, you know? Like, that's all that is. And then in 1920, a year later, 11 labor candidates um, won seats, won um, uh, seats in, in the, uh, in the, in the, parliament uh and four of them were strike leaders right and then it was 20 years later so 1940 1940 until uh canada recognized collective bargaining so 20 years after that strike you know so again it was kind of the same thing is this was the second time that we were seeing some kind of a very large movement like this crop up and I don't think any any of the leaders really could predict or understand what what the pattern of behavior was going to be in terms of like what the government was going to do. They kind of just came out and were like, "Look, Ed, let's can maybe we can talk about it," you know, like like a schoolyard bully, you know, like that's what that's what I used to do for schoolyard bullies. Is whenever like when I first moved to this country, like people did not understand uh, anything about me. You know, like I wore, I wore a dress shirt and dress pants to school, you guys. And then I showed up and there was like a kid uh, in a sleeveless shirt and just ripped up jeans. And I was just like, well, that's different. And they were, and they looked at me and they were like, well, that is something we have to kill. Uh, and I was just like, hey, uh, I could see your shoulders. That's, that's like, that's like not a thing that I'm used to. And then they were like, we don't like your face. Um, I was like, oh, can we talk about why you don't like my face? And they're like, no. We're just gonna uh, punch you, and that's and that's basically how uh, the 1919 Winnipeg government uh, treated the strikers. 
Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day, so make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and, uh, and if you, if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you, if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and uh, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do, and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.